Okay, on to section 1.2 where we actually get to start solving some stuff instead of just verifying all the time. And so in order to solve, we need a little bit more information. So we're going to call these initial value problems, and they're going to give you some more information so that you can solve your ordinary differential equation. So um, typically, and again, this notation is not correct. This is going to be a subscript zero. So typically when you're solving initial value problem, they're going to give you an initial condition of some kind. Um, some people call this x sub zero. Some people call it x naught. Um, that zero, that naught stands for initial, which means you're, um, you know, the, 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 typically this is in terms of time. So it's usually the moment that you start the clock or the time begins. Okay, so once we have these initial conditions, then we can solve problems, and instead of having all these arbitrary um, constants, we can actually find the value of the constant. So remember, in the last section, section one, we left everything very generically, and we left it arbitrary, where we had um, unknown constants, C1, C2, Cn, and now we're going to actually start substituting our initial conditions back into our original functions and all of the derivatives so that we can find those unknown constants based on a condition. And so that's going to be called an initial that's going to be named an initial value problem and just for shorting shortening it up we're going to call it IVP initial value problem. So, um when you go to solve these problems, they are going to have to give you an initial condition, which they label IC, um, depending on how what variables you're using in your problem. Usually, they'll give you an x naught value. So, for example, I might say that x naught equals I don't know one. It could be C. It could be anything. And then you are going to substitute that initial condition into your equation so that you can find your initial y value. If there are derivatives that you are working with, you're also going to have to substitute the initial condition into your derivatives to find your value of your derivative at that location as well. So there's going to be a lot of substituting when you go to do these problems. So depending on um, what order of derivative you have, um, kind of lets you know how many substitutions are required. The easiest problems are going to be your first order um, ordinary differential equations. If you're dealing with the first order, then you really only have to do one substitution. You're going to substitute your initial condition into your function, and that's going to give you um, your starting location. If you are dealing with a second order differential equation, you're going to have to substitute into your original equation y to find your complete initial condition point. Remember, your point is going to have x naught, y naught. And then you're going to have to substitute a second time to find the um, derivative at that location. And if you remember from Calc 1, the derivative is the slope of your function at that location. So you can kind of do a visual um, review to make sure that your answer makes sense. So um, here's a real um, easy visual example of what's going on. Remember that your ordinary differential equations are usually families of functions or families of solutions. So if I didn't give you any initial condition, then you could, t you could have infinite number of solutions um, to the problem. They would just be generic in terms of a constant, an unknown constant, C1, C2, some unknown constant. But as soon as I give you an initial condition, what that means is that your graph has to travel through that point. And if your graph does not travel through that point on the specified interval, then something's wrong. So in order to be a solution to initial value problem, your solution y has to travel through the point x not y not on the interval i. And if any of those things aren't true, you're in trouble. Once you go up to a second order differential equation, there's one more thing that must be true. In addition to your function traveling through your initial point x naught y naught on the interval i, 
in addition, your derivative must be equal to the slope of the tangent line at that location. So again, these are all things you can check visually if you're taking an exam, if you're working on your homework, if you just want to make sure that your answer makes sense. So let's look at um, a problem that we did in the previous chapter. Oh, by the way, the term initial condition, it's really a physics concept because usually we're talking about position, velocity, or acceleration at a specific time. And um, usually it's t equals zero, but they'll call the initial time t naught. So um, when we talk about initial conditions, just, just know that it comes from physics where we're talking about motion and particles in motion. So let's look at an example that we checked out in section 1.1. One, one. So in section 1.1, one, one, we were trying to solve the ordinary differential equation y prime equals y. And they told us that we had a solution to that equation. And they said that the solution was y equals c e to the x. And they gave us the interval, which was nice. Sometimes you have to find the interval, but they gave it to us. And they said the interval was negative infinity to infinity. Now, what they're going to do differently in this chapter or this section is they're going to give you an initial condition. So in this example, they said, you know what, it's the same problem, except we want the initial condition that y of 0 equals 3. So remember, that's really an ordered pair. So what they're saying is that when x equals 0, y equals 3. So what are you going to do with that? You're going to take it down to your equation, your solution equation, y equals c e to the x. And wherever you see the x, you're going to substitute in the 0. And wherever you see the y, you are going to substitute in the 3, and that is going to allow you to find the unknown constant c. So you got to remember a little bit of algebra here. We know that anything raised to the 0 exponent is equal to 1, and we know that c times 1 is equal to c. So in this case, our unknown constant c is equal to 3. So the solution to the initial value problem is actually y equals 3 e to the x. And then if you wanted to verify that graphically, you would show that y equals 3 to the x passes through the point 0, 3 on the interval of negative infinity to infinity. Let's make this problem a little more complicated um, by having it go through a different point. Okay, so again, they have told us that the differential equation is y prime equals y. They have said the solution to the differential equation is y equals c e to the x. They still kept us on the interval from negative infinity to infinity. And this time they gave us the condition y of 1 equals negative 2. So keep in mind that this is the 1 is your x and the negative 2 is your y. So if you wanted to write that as an ordered pair, it would be the point negative 1, 2. So we're going to take that over to what we believe the solution to the ordinary differential equation is, and we're going to substitute it in. So y is the negative 2, c is what we're solving for, and e is being raised to the first power. So e raised to the first power is the natural number e, and if we wanted to isolate c, we would divide both sides by e. So we could say c is equal to negative 2 over e, or if you don't like that, you can say c is equal to negative 2 e to the negative 1. Now that's the value of c. That is not the solution of your ordinary differential equation. The solution of your ordinary differential equation is y equals... negative 2 e to the negative 1 e to the x. Now you can simplify that further um, because you have two items that have base e. You can add their exponents together because that's, um, that's the product rule. They're being multiplied so you can add their exponents together. So that would be negative 2 e to the x minus 1. So your solution to the initial value problem is this and it is on the same interval 
negative infinity to infinity. And again, you can check both cases graphically. Um, problem A is up here in blue. Notice we are going through the point 0, 3 on the interval negative infinity to infinity. Problem B is down at the bottom in red. And again, notice we're going through the initial point 1 to negative 2. So you can always check your answers. So as the problems get more complicated, so will the solutions, okay? So for example, this was a problem that we saw in section 1.1. And again, this problem has um, two unknown constants, okay? So we are saying that the ordinary differential equation, um, we're saying that the ordinary differential equation is this um, x squared plus 16x equals zero. Now, in section one, we had verified that C1 cosine of 4t and C2 sine of 4t was a solu solution in the homework. So I'm not going to go back and show you that work again, but again, what we would do is take the derivative of each, substitute it in, make sure that we can create an identity. What's new though, is that we now have some initial conditions for this problem. So if you look, they gave us the first initial condition and this is related to um, x. So they're saying when t is equal to pi over two, oops, when t is equal to pi over two, x is equal to negative two. And then they gave us an initial condition about the derivative and they said when t is equal to pi over 2, the slope of the tangent line is 1. Okay, so what the heck do we do with that? Well, essentially what's going to happen, we're going to have to solve ourselves a system of equations so that we can figure out what the values of c1 and c2 are. Okay, so <laughs> this is going to feel more like algebra than calculus. Okay. So the first thing we're going to want to do is um, figure out what x prime is. And then once we know what x prime is, we can take our function x and our function x prime. We can substitute in the given initial conditions, and we'll be able to solve for c1 and c2. Okay, so we know that x is unknown constant 1 times cosine of 4t plus unknown constant 2 times sine of 4t. So if you wanted to, you could go ahead and substitute in your initial condition. We know that when t equals pi over 2, that x will equal negative 2. And then in this problem, because it's a trig equation that involves um, 2 pi, it simplifies really easily. I will say <laughs> usually that's not the case. Um, so don't get too used to that. But So again, you're going to have to remember your unit circles um, in order to evaluate these, or depend on technology. But... Um, if you know your unit circle 2 pi is located right here, and that ordered pair is 1, 0, and remember that cosine corresponds with the x and sine corresponds with the y. So cosine of 2 pi is 1, and sine of 2 pi is 0. So we really scored. We already found our initial coefficient c1. Usually it's um, a little more in depth than that, but we lucked out for our first problem ever. Okay, now th that we got from our original equation x. Now we're going to have to take the derivative of our original equation x so that we can find out um, so that we can find out 
um, the C2. Okay, so now we're going to take the derivative of our equation. Okay, so when we go to take the derivative of this, this is technically a chain rule. So C1 is just a constant and it can hang out there. Um, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And the derivative of 4t is 4. So sorry, this is hard to see, but that says negative 4c1 sine of 4t. Then we have to do the derivative of c2 sine of 4t. So again, c2 is a constant. The derivative of sine is cosine. And the derivative of 4t is 4. Then we have to plug in our values. So we know that when t is pi over 2, that x prime is 1. And again, because we're working with um, pi over 2, sine of uh, 4 times pi over 2 is 2 pi, and sine of 2 pi is 0. Cosine of 2 pi is 1. So that means C2 is 1 fourth. Now a lot of people are like, yay, I'm done, it's over. Um, that's not the solution, that's just the value of C1 and C2. So your solution to the initial value problem is x equals negative 2 cosine of 4t plus 1 fourth sine of 4t. And then again, you should tell me what interval it is on. The final topic that you're going to see in section 1-2 is going to talk to you about existence and uniqueness. And those are two uh, different things. So when you are talking about ordinary differential equations, there's two basic questions that um, you may need to be able to answer. And one is whether a solution exists. So if they, um, that's the existence definition. If there is a solution, and it doesn't have to be one singular one, if there is any solution, multiple solutions, then we would say that a solution does exist. And then they'll talk to you about uniqueness. So uniqueness is when you get down to one particular solution where no other solution exists. If, if there's only one specific solution, then it's called a unique solution. Um, there is a nice little theorem to help you with first order differential equations. Second order differential equations when it comes to existence and uniqueness, we're gonna wait until chapter four because that gets uh, quite a bit more complex. So again, uh, I kind of already covered this, but if the, solution, if the differential equation has a solution, then a solution exists, and if there is precisely one, then it is a unique solution. So we have already seen an example um, that we've gone through a couple of times that has a solution. It is the ordinary differential equation dy dx equals xy to the one half. We have shown that it has two solutions. So if they asked you, does a solution exist? You would say, yes, a solution does exist. Um, and then if they said, is it a unique solution? We would say no, because there are two solutions that go through the same point. And then this is the visual representation of what's happening. So the blue graph that you see is the first solution. Notice that goes through the point zero, zero. And the red graph that you see is y equals zero, which also goes through the point zero, zero. So those are two solutions of this initial value problem. So here's the theorem that um, for, this is specifically for first order differential equations. And this is a very popular theorem that gets used often, and it's because it's it's really easy 
um, to use and to verify. Okay, so this theorem is going to tell you not only if a solution exists on a certain interval, but if it is a unique solution. Okay, so they're going to define things very specifically. So first, they're going to define your region. So they tell you that you need to be on a rectangular region R. Okay, so I'm just going to draw a rectangle here. So this is your region R, and it is in the xy plane, and that your x is going to be bounded between A and B, and that your y is going to be bound between C and D, and that um, this region contains your initial point x naught y naught. Okay, so you have to make sure you have defined you have this defined region first. Now, if your function f of x y and notice the terminal your notation here, the partial derivative of your function with respect to y, if they are both continuous on R, then that shows there is a unique fun a unique solution on this interval that's a solution to your first order derivative. And of course they're going to define h. So think of that as like if you remember in calc one we did delta epsilon proofs. The h is kind of your delta. So the this h defines your interval. Okay, so if your function and your partial derivative of your function with respect to y are continuous on this region R, then there exists a unique solution on this interval, and they call the interval I naught um, to represent where the unique solution can exist. And here's the picture of what I just drew. Okay, so again, here's an example. If we look at um, the one we were talking about earlier where the partial derivative of y with respect to x is xy to the 1 half, um, we already know that it has two solutions, um, but if we wanted to use the theorem to show that there was a different interval, the first thing we would have to do is to find the function. So notice the right-hand side of your differential equation is what we're going to call our function. So our function of that is y, or sorry, x, y to the 1 half. Now, where is that continuous? Well, keep in mind that a 1 half power is a square root. So where are square roots continuous? Square roots are continuous everywhere um, greater than or equal to 0. Then we would take the derivative of that function, the partial derivative, with respect to y. So when you take the partial derivative with respect to y, you treat the x like a constant. So x, consider it a constant. If we did the power rule on y to the 1 half, we would get 1 half y to the negative 1 half. And then if you want to make it look like they have, the x would be in the numerator, the 2 is in the denominator, and then because um, 1 half is really a square root, it's really a square root in the denominator. Now where would this be continuous? Well, you can't have it equal to 0 because it's in a denominator. You're not allowed to divide by 0. You would have to be greater than 0. So if you were on any interval on the upper half of the region that was... Um, larger than zero for the y value, you would have a continuous um, function and you would have a continuous partial derivative. So then you would have a unique solution. But at zero, because we are discontinuous at zero because of our partial derivative having that denominator there, um, we cannot guarantee that we would have a unique solution. Okay, so the theorem essentially is going to enable us to, co to conclude whether we have um, a unique solution or not. And again, th for that particular example, it would have to be anywhere where y was greater than zero. Um, 
Where you have to be really careful is, is in semantics, it's in definitions, because we're using a lot of words in this section to define intervals. First of all, we have our domain of our function, and then we have our interval of solutions, but then we also have our interval of a, of a unique solution. Those three things do not have to be identical. So you need to be really careful. You need to understand the definition of each one. Okay, so it is possible for your domain to be larger than where solutions exist and where solutions exist to be larger than where unique solutions exist. So be very, very careful with this. Um, it can get tricky. If you have questions or you need to see examples, let me know. I'm happy to record a specific example for you where you need to be really careful when you use the theorem that we just covered about the existence and uniqueness of solutions for first order differential equations, that definition does not work in reverse. Okay, so we know that if the function on R is continuous, and we know that if the partial derivative of the function with respect to Y on R is continuous, that there's going to be a unique solution on that interval. But what if one of those conditions is not true? What if f is not continuous? What if the partial derivative of f is not continuous? You have to be very careful. It, if something's not true, we can't really use that theorem at all. Anything could happen. We could have a unique solution, we could have multiple solutions, or we could have no solution at all, okay? So make sure you don't use that theorem both ways. And then in general, whenever you're asked to define an interval, make sure you define the largest interval possible, okay? So go to the maximum extreme value, the minimum extreme value that you can, okay? And this kind of reviews what I just said on the last slide. Okay, so I'm going to leave you there for section 1.2. Please let me know if you have any questions, and I will talk to you soon.